gooing this one a little bit early today. Um, so normally I record my UFC breakdown reaction videos on Sunday because, well, the fight card usually ends at like 1 a.m. my time and uh, I'm sleepy and I'm ready to go to bed. And in this case, not not so much because it's like, you know, it ended at like 5 p.m. 6 p.m. I guess somewhere between 5 and 6 p.m. It's now 7. All right. So let's talk about the card. And before we get into that, I do I do want to talk about one PFL item because the big conversation right now is the PFL had Roush Monfio and Natan Schulte fight, and it was a terrible fight. And I've seen the fight, and it's garbage. It is it, it, it is garbage fight. However, however, the background story of this is the PFL decided to book these two guys, pres- but with, with the idea that this fight would be terrible. And therefore, they could disqualify the winner from the tournament for a, I think it's a manifestly unsporting fighter, something like that. I'm not sure what the language they use. Because I forget which way this goes, but like, Schulte or Monfio is the godfather of the other one's daughter. Like, we're talking about fighters that are not training partners, not friends but are essentially family. And yeah, every time, almost every time in combat sports, we have gone through the hazards and the hassle of getting someone that close to the other one to fight each other. The fight has sucked. So, conspiracy theory here, PFL wanted this fight to suck so bad that they get Shane Burgos their big free agent signing, their big deal signing off of the UFC into the playoffs. And don't get me wrong, the idea of Shane Burgos fighting Clay Collard, which I believe is the matchup, is a heck of a lot more interesting than him fighting Natan Schulte, I believe would have been the matchup. It was it was so bad that I legitimately don't actually remember who won. <laughs> Natan... Was it was was it Schulte or Monfio that actually won? I I can't even remember. Um, yeah, it was it, it was Schulte that won. I was right. I was right. Natan Schulte did win, and the fight sucked. And like you know, even on uh, even on Tapology here, potential legitimacy issues, whatever. I get that. I get that. But then, but people are like, well, w- 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 the PFL is completely right to do this. Com- the the PFL is completely. The, the fight sucked, therefore we don't care about the guys. Here's the thing. The PFL knew this fight was going to suck. They made it anyways. They, you know, they should have to deal with it. Part of part of the PFL's promotional crap, I say crap because all the promotional crap is crap, but part of their, P, their promotional stuff is the whole tournament format, wins matter, doesn't matter who's more exciting, blah, 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 blah. We're not, we're, we're, we're pure sport. And then you do this. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like when I critique Dana White and the UFC on the, uh, well, specifically Dana White on the whole, like, we don't do gimmick fights. Now here's this gimmick fight that I am promoting right for you that you need to get hyped about. It's not that like, it's a gimmick fight. It's not, it's that you are contradicting your own business, your own stated business model to promote stuff. And that is what the PFL is doing here. You should have to suck it up and accept that Burgos is not in the playoffs. Also, Burgos' fight makes me really, really think that um, he knew this was going to happen. Because I... I m- I fully believe Burgos could have finished Nishikawa. I fully believe uh, Burgos sh- uh, fights way more aggressively most of the time than the fight that he had with Nishikawa. So, I feel like he might have been in on this, the idea of you just have to win and you're going to advance. And they and they, pro- they, they may not have told him anything about a fix. Is it? Maybe they'd be like, uh, Schulte's got hurt. He got injured. He uh, he can't continue because that fight happened before Burgos's fight. So they're like, 
No, you just have to you just have to make it through. Like something happened with the Brazilians and 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 neither of them can go through. And um well, that's it. So it's a massive black guy for PFL. Tremendously so. And um it's a shame because PFL seems to have the finances behind it and some level of business acumen to change the industry, uh, change the marketplace, basically. And uh, and then to a degree they have the Francis contract and so on. But then they have to go, they have to like take that step forward. They take that giant step forward. Like we got Francis and Ganu. We've guaranteed his opponent a minimum purse. And we've done all these things that should be a massive PR win. And then this, we shoot ourselves directly in the balls. <laughs> Okay, and to be clear, also screwing over like two of their like mainstay fighters who have been here for a long time and realistically are part of why the PFL has actually done so well and how it's structured. Like all the PFL vets, all the guys who like help build that company should be like shooting the bird right now at the PFL. Anyways, that that is my take on that stupidity. So let's move on to the UFC card where we also had some stupidity because we had some we had some dumb stuff here, but we had some good fights too. The main event was pretty good. I enjoyed Josh Emmett versus Ilya Teporia. I enjoyed Macy Barber, Amanda Hebush a lot more than I expected to. David Onama, Gabriel Santos, that was good. Knew that was going to be good. Brendan Allen versus Bruno Silva, that was good. Knew that was going to be good. Uh, Randy Brown, well, he determined was fine. Rebeski versus Radz- uh, Radzaboff. Uh, Radz- Radziabov, uh was pretty good as well. Uh, Tabitha Ricci proved me wrong yet again. Uh, Joshua Van looks really, really good. Trevor Peak Chepe Mariscal was so much fun, but so much brain damage. Um, Jamal Emmer's Jack J- Jenkins was also a good fight, and I didn't see the opener. So, for the most part, it was a good card. There are a couple of fights in here that I'm going to crap on, but there it is. Something else I'm going to crap on here is Man, the commentary was not on its game. And to be clear, this is this could be my jet my personal lack of preference for Daniel Cormier's humor. If you like Daniel Cormier and you find him funny and he is a highlight of a card to you, continue to do so. It's fine. That is subjective. What I will say is that objectively his analyst outside and his analysis outside of wrestling does suck. And Dom Cruz had his salty boy pants on on this one and was a mess. So, you know, that's that's out of the way, but I'll probably still bring it up. Uh, Taporia versus Josh Emmett. I scored all five rounds for Taporia. He, for the most part, um, and I, I scored a 10 8 in the fourth round. Uh, for the most part, he, you know, did what I expected him to do. Like the head movement was there. The striking defense was there. The just absolutely lighting up Josh Emmett, who himself is not terribly hard to hit. If you can move fast, um, was all there. And when I was actually pretty surprised that he, um, he more or less just wrestled Josh Emmett kind of at will admittedly only in the fifth round. Maybe that was Emmett being just really, really beat up or whatever, but it did seem that like he physically overwhelmed Emmett whenever they, you know, had sort of a mano a mano battle of physicality, which is impressive because Emmett is a beast, even though he's pushing 40. Scorecards were a bit weird. One judge gave Emmett or gave Emmett the first round. I'm kind of curious now. I've got the UFC stats up here. And we know the UFC stats are not uh are not the be end all end all, but like what do they say? They had Taporia outlanding him 21 to 14. And there was no takedowns or anything like that to consider. And in general, Taporia was running forward. This was one of Emmett's better rounds, I guess. Although, to me, and here's the I'm, I'm also going to critique the uh, the 50-42 card that um that uh was turned in for uh for Taporia because I I like part of it, but I really dislike uh, another part of it. Um, I don't think there's a round here you can give to Emmett. I think he lost all five rounds. Um, now, we'll talk about the 50-42 card. I was 
Obviously, I scored the fight 50-44. I am in agreement with Sal Diamato's card, which causes me to die a little bit inside. But Christopher Lee gave a 50-42 to card. Um, I think it was him anyways. Let me make sure I have the right judges. I have the scorecard right here. Unfortunately, it's at the bottom of the page. <laughs> Instead of at the top. Uh, there it is. Yeah, I had Sal Diamato's card. Eric Colomb was the one that gave a, a round to Emmett, which makes no sense. And Christopher Lee is the one that gave it 10-7 in the fourth round and 10-8 in the third round. I don't hate on the 10-7, actually. Uh, the technical definition of a 10-7 is one where like a stoppage would be would be um would be perfectly fine, would be perfectly acceptable. And by the end of the fourth round, while I didn't think Mark Goddard, the referee, had done anything wrong by not stopping the fight, I think he could have stepped in. So that's not bad. That is not bad at all. So I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't like the 10-8 third round he gave, though. Because the third round, don't get me wrong, Emmett got hurt in the third round. And he lost the third round. I have no problem with that. But it was also by far his most effective offensive round. It's the one where he landed the most strikes. It's the round where he, I thought, actually did have Taporia hurt at one point. This was the round where Taporia kind of uh, did what he always does, which is like this whole thing where he forgets his defense. He shows you the defense like, I'm slick. I'm rolling the punches. I'm slipping. I'm moving my head. I've got the guard up. Um, but um, he forgot it here for like 30 seconds of the round. And I thought Emmett actually did legitimately connect and uh, shock him. It was it was the round where he, I thought, did damage, which is the primary criteria, to Taporia. So I don't. I don't get it. I in, in no planet do I think he won the round. I want to make that clear. But in no planet should that have been the the 10-8 round. So I disagree with that pretty wholeheartedly. But uh, at the end of the day, he won the fight. He got his just desserts there. This is going to sound incredibly unsexy, what I have next for him. I have a title eliminator fight against Mozar Ivalev. I know that that is... So unsexy for a next fight for him. It feels, it, it honestly feels almost like a step down. The issue with Featherweight is you have Max Holloway and you have Alexander Volkanovsky at the top. And you want to keep any title contender away from Max Holloway because if he beats them, you have nothing. Volkanovsky's fighting Yair Rodriguez. Number three on the list is Brian Ortega, who really should not be in title contention. Arnold Allen, who just lost to Max Holloway. Josh Emmett, who just lost to, well, Ilya Taporia. Calvin Cater, who should not be in title contention because he lost to Emmett. Also, he's coming back from like major, major injury, and like uh, I just wouldn't stick him in there. And then Giga Chikadze, or pardon me, then Korean Zombie, who is booked and shouldn't be in title contention. And then you have Giga Chikadze, who should not be in title condition, that leaves us with the sad, sad fact that number nine, Taporia, which will increase. He'll be top five next time the rankings come out. And number 10, Ivalev, is actually the best you got. It's actually the best thing you got in terms of healthy, riding on a high streak, fighters to put against each other. You could give Taporia just the title shot off this, and I would not hate it. But I do think Evilev is the answer. Like, unfortunately, Emmett got thrashed by Yair Rodriguez. And uh, while he was still number five, and warrantedly so, I think it just put him far down. I don't know. It's what I would do. I know. I know it's not sexy. Uh, Emmett, I've got against Brian Ortega. Because one of them has to drop out of this, like, top ten and, like, make that happen. Um... Amanda Hebus, uh, Macy Barber. Uh, this was a... Oh, oh, no, I got to talk about this. Okay. In the main event, Dom Cruz had a bit of, like, cauliflower ear protects the brain. And that was so stupid. That was that was so dumb. If if you want that proven to be dumb, like, just, just research what cauliflower ear is. People have written, like, large, 
articles in the MMA media about like cauliflower ear and specifically what it does and what it's a reaction to and what benefits that there may or may not be. Um, no, it does it. No, it does not protect your brain. Please, please do not believe that. <laughs> um, now we'll go on to Amanda Hebosh versus Macy Barber. Uh, this is a good fight. Uh, I thought Barber won the the first round essentially because Hebosh went after a, a leg lock, didn't get it, went after it for way, 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 way too long, got dropped on, got bombed on. Um, prior to that, I did think she did look like what I expected. She is the cleaner striker, the more technical striker, the more creative striker. And it was interesting to see that she could get Barber to back off because that's a hallmark of Barber. She does not really give ground. She did here. Um, and that's the first of like the positive points for Barber. I think that suggests that she is becoming more flexible. And I think another big thing, I think she's training with people who can actually physically strike with her because I thought that was the, that was to be honest, the biggest thing in her early fights that I really thought was that Macy Barber has never not bullied someone in the gym. And I think that's coming to an end finally. I think she's getting comfortable with the idea that at some point she'll get stung back and that someone will meet her physicality with physicality and she can now actually regroup and do something about that in the fight. So that was a big change. Now, I will say the alpha male corner... Which, by the way, in the main event, should have stopped it after the Emmett fight. Uh, Emmett did not know what round he was in. And also, I don't think he could see. And his leg was... I didn't even talk about the leg kicks. Taporia ate his le- lead leg up. And like it was buckling in the in the, uh, in the the fourth round. I actually, I actually thought the first time that Emmett got dropped in the fourth round, it was actually just his leg giving out. I watched the replay. And I still actually stand by that. I still think it was actually the leg giving out more so than him getting hit. He did get hit. But... Uh, but uh, the, the reaction is his eyes were completely clear and whatever when he was when he was on the ground. Like there was no there was no shock from getting hit. I just think his leg gave out and uh, and that got eaten up. So failure there. Failure also here with the uh, OK, maybe this is useful to Barber. Maybe it is. I don't know, but it really shouldn't be. She's like everything she's building is off the jab. No crap. A good, like, technical textbook game almost builds everything off the jab. And what, what was hilarious is that right after they made that observation, uh, Barbara got hit with a right hand clean straight off of no setup. <laughs> and it's like, well, I guess uh, I guess if you yell out that everything comes off the jab, she could throw something that's not a jab and hit you right in the face. Uh, he must also got a pair of uh, headlock takeovers in this one, which led to Dominic Cruz yelling about women's MMA being middle school wrestling. He's not entirely wrong. I I know I have some female. Uh, I actually, uh, I have a, a more than half my audience is female, which thank you, ladies. But um, um, I know you're gonna. I I, I know this is gonna come off wrong or whatever but like it kind of is the, the 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 headlock takeover thing that is in women's mma has always um greatly perplexed me about um the wrestling i i, I don't i don't really know why it doesn't go away like valentina shashenko tyler santos was like the greatest example of this of like i'm just gonna keep doing this and keep getting my back taken and whatever and it's like all right that's one fight but like so much of this is just bad um at least Hebos had like a game plan. Like if it failed, that was what led to the D bar. Unfortunately, that game plan got her like just, you know, split open. Um, her nose was smashed at the end of the first round. Barbara was bleeding too. So like it went both ways. But uh, yeah. Uh, then we get into the second round. I actually relatively enjoyed uh, Hebos's corner. Uh, she's talking about like, they were talking about like the things that were going well, effectively, I thought. They were talking about the things to stay away from, effectively, I thought. And then here we go. Let's go. Big old one, two from Hebosh, which smashes up uh, uh, Barbara's nose pretty good. But and and also a very, very, very nice hook off the clinch. So like Hebosh starts around pretty good, looking good, looking great. Mm, got the second headlock takedown that I was talking about before. Tried to use a can opener, which uh, I was watching the fights with Byron and he was on super delay for reasons. Uh, and I was waiting for him to kind of freak out about the can opener. 
and I was not disappointed. Uh, he loves the can opener. He's a big fan of the can opener because he's huge. <laughs> um, and uh, <sighs> Barbara was pinned on the ground for a little bit there, but like at the same time, she's moving well. She's keeping Hebosh from piling up offense. She looked way more competent on her back than she has previously. So again, improvement number two. And then eventually she head kicked. She got back to her feet. There was a bit where they both clipped each other. They both stumbled. And then Barbara hits a head kick, falls up with a flurry of punches, rocks uh, Hebus. Hebus goes down, drops the elbows, referee stops it. Big win for Macy Barber. Uh, I am going to say this. There, there is a weird segment of the Macy Barber fan base that loves to defend her and like talk about how Oh, you guys wrote her off after two wit losses and, and you were like really, really mean to her. No, we were really mean to her. People who were critiquing her because she said, I am going to be the champion, youngest champion in UFC history. I'm going to be unstoppable and I'm going to destroy things. And there is going to be no bump in the road. And and then you also have her father with the Roxy, uh, Roxy Amonofari fight where it's like the blown out knee, uh, you know, uh, is all that happened and ignoring that she was losing beforehand. There was there was a delusion to Barber's game that was always going to limit her. And she seems to be coming out of that. She went to Team Alpha Male, not the gym I would have picked, but it's a solid gym. She seems to be responding to coaching. Her father is having less and less to do with her corner, which is good because he's an idiot. And she is becoming better. This was this was a massive step forward. It's not that she was too old. She's still young enough. But obviously, if you're going if you're talking about becoming the youngest champion ever, there is no time for speed bumps. That's all anyone really ever critiqued her on. I'm sure there's an exception to that. I'm sure there's. Someone who thought she was done. Um, and obviously, I picked Hebosh here, obviously. But, like, it was to do with the fact that Hebosh is someone who's really, really good. I, I tend to pick Barber. Uh, I could be wrong here, but I want to say I almost always pick Barber. Uh, let's have a look here. Macy Barber's recent fights. Uh, I picked her to beat KGB Lee. She did. Picked her to beat Jessica High. And she did. Picked her to beat Montana Del Rosa. She did. So you have to go back to 2021 in her fight with Miranda Maverick, which I still think she lost to find me picking against her again. So I don't know. I think I feel like I have defended my point of view. <laughs> um, anyways, great performance. Great fight. I have her against Lauren Murphy next. It just kind of makes sense. Murphy still has a little bit of name value and you can go out there and do that. Hebush, I don't really know because she's a straw weight and a flyweight. I do think that long-term flyweight is the answer. But maybe you do the winner of um, Natalia Silva and uh, KGB Lee, which I tend to think is going to be Natalia Silva. So that would be a fun fight. Uh, Austin Lane, Justin Taffa didn't really happen. Um, basically, Lane landed like uh, a body kick and two follow-up punches. Taffa came in to throw a big right hand, I think it was. Missed. And uh, got uh, got three stooges in the eyeballs. And the only thing I really have to say is this should be a DQ. I under I I'm not suggesting Austin Lane tried to blind this man. I'm not suggesting that. But he stuck all four fingers towards the eye in a manner that should result in a DQ if the guy can't continue. And the eye, it also is a bad look just in general. They're going like, uh, well, can he continue? The camera like goes up close to the eye and you see it like swelling up. And, I swear I saw a little bit of pus. Like, I swear I saw like the signs of infection in the, uh, in the eyelid. Um, no, no, he could not. He could not see. What are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, we got a no contest. It shouldn't be a no contest. It should be a DQ. There you go. I don't care what you do with either of these guys. Mostly because, to be clear, I don't care about the division. Austin Lane is going to get bizarrely high placings on cards because I suspect, being a former NFL player, 
He actually negotiated himself a reasonably high-paying deal. The UFC will generally put those on high, and he'll basically be Greg Hardy 2.0, only he's actually worse. Because while he is probably a better person, because Greg Hardy is terrible, he is a worse fighter than Greg Hardy. He's also probably a worse athlete than Greg Hardy. And um, will probably be doomed to fights like this. I just don't care. Uh, and I, I mean, I like Tafa. I like Tafa enough, but like it's heavyweight, man. It's uh, there's no real structure to like kind of base it on. I have, I have, I have no idea how to match make outside of at the very, very top of the division for that division. Uh, David Onama, Gabriel Santos. This is a good fight. This is a dope fight. Um, I thought Santos won the first round. Uh, I do, I do kind of wonder if he was given it. Let me pull up the cards here. I didn't really think to look at the card for this fight because it didn't go to decision. So what are you going to do? By the way, uh, Barbara was up one round on all three cards, which makes sense. We have no scores for the half of fight. Uh, yep. Okay. Santos took it on all three cards. So, hey, there you go. They did a good They did. Uh, they did a good job. And what I mean by that is because in this round, uh, Onama was on top a lot, and that sometimes suckers people into actually scoring the fight for him. But he was, uh, he was, I believe, outlanded. I could be wrong. Striking numbers were super close. Be interested, actually. We've got the numbers now. Let's, uh, let's have a look. There it is. Official numbers, 27-25 for Nama. So he landed two extra significant strikes and was outstruck 33-30 to 30 overall. But Santos actually had two like very legitimate arm bar attempts. And to go back to a really, really, really old debate that people had, yeah, the attempt at the arm bar is worth far more than escaping the arm bar. Because otherwise, my lord, are people not going to go for submissions? And my lord, are people not going to be incentivized? Like, John Fitch would love it if, like, his submission defense was tr credited the same as a submission attempt. Because he would just sit and guard all day. And you do not want to incentivize that. Um, now, to be clear, I think a submission attempt has to be serious. And this one was. This one was. I thought I, there, was, there was a moment there where I did legitimately think Onama might get tapped out. Round two comes around. Santos comes out pressuring Odama nicely, standing, puts him against the against the fence, jumps on his back, drags him to the mat. I'm like, all right, here we go. But Odama outscrambles him, gets to top control, lands some very, very nice elbows. Very nice elbows. He was cut more comfortable throwing ground pound here. That was beautiful. However, all the hallmarks of Onama's problems still absolutely there. Dude is like just exploding into everything on the planet. And ending up in trouble, and it's like, could you, could you stop doing that at some point? At some point, could you stop? <laughs> could you not? At some point, could you not? Uh, because it's, it's just going to kill his gas tank and bring him down super hard. Um, that being said, it, it 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 did the job. He managed to get back to his feet, managed to outscramble him, managed to ah, uh, what was the knockout shot this time? Uppercut, right. He uppercuts Santos to another dimension, then does the Izzy Archer celebration, which is lame. And I want to be clear on this. It's not that the celebration is lame or that celebrating a KO is lame or anything like that. It's that be your own man. Like just in general, come up with your own thing. It's the same as like people who used to, to steal uh, Tito Ortiz's Gravedigger celebration thing. That's a Tito thing. This is an Izzy thing. And the Izzy thing, it had like storyline with Alex Bahia and everything. And I'm unaware of Gabriel Santos being like big into archery or anything. Maybe he is. But um, just just be you. It's kind of like the it's kind of like going back to the Ian Gary thing when he was like being very, very much a faux Conor McGregor. Just be you, man. Just be you. It's gonna come off. Way better. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit gassy right now. I had pizza. Um, that's another reason I don't usually do these directly after the card. So I've normally, you know, stuffed myself with junk food. Um, yeah, otherwise it was a good fight. Uh, the same concerns I have coming into the fight are still very much there. But hey, you could do like Onama versus Jonathan Pierce or something. And you could do Gabriel Santos, who is now 0-2 in the UFC, but, you know, is 
very, very good. You could do something like uh, Kyle Nelson for him. Uh, Brendan Allen made pretty short work, actually, of uh, of Bruno Silva. Not to say that Silva wasn't doing dangerous things here. Like, he, he landed some very, very clean, like, overhand slash hooks against Allen. He definitely found the chin and so on. But, um... He one of those times he had Allen hurt. Allen started firing back, dropped him, went for the ground and pound. Boom, 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 boom. Takes the back. RNC tap out. Boom. Uh, he asked for a title eliminator with Jared Cannonier. Nope. You don't want that fight. You do not want that fight. I have like Nazardine Imovov uh, for Allen, and I've got uh, since that rematch with Chris Curtis doesn't appear to have any traction. Um. And then you could do Bruno Silva versus Edmund Shabazian uh, as two guys who need a little uh, reworking here. There was an interesting storyline going into that fight, though. Um, So a lot of people were like very, very angry that Allen was a big favorite against Bruno Silva. And they're like, this man went to decision with Poatan. He went to decision with Alex Bahia. He should win this fight. And it's like, okay. If you thought Bruno Silva should win this fight and you had a reason other than that, I am perfectly ready to go with you. Um, I I debated it. I pondered picking Bruno Silva. But you have to realize something that MMA math, again, does not work. Poetan asks none of the same questions that Brennan Allen does. Not one question that Poetan asks is a Brennan Allen question. Brennan Allen in terms of Bruno Silva's prior opponents, was very much GM3. Like, that that was the model. And GM3 pulled them apart. And I don't want to say the same thing happened here, because it didn't. But similar things happened here and led to Brendan Allen winning. I, I just I just want M. Matt to, to die. Uh, Neil Magny, Philip Rowe. I got nothing to say about this fight. It was a Neil Magny fight against uh, a guy who looks like Neil Magny. I don't mean that he's black. I mean, they're both six foot three and they both have like similar body structure and they both have the same hairdo. And uh, yeah, no, uh, it was a clinch fest. Uh, I thought Magny won. Um, I guess I'm happy that he won. Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um. Oh, I, I'm. I'm trying. I'm trying to read my notes here. And I just realized it's just the judges' scorecards. This is a play decision. Uh, Magni versus Randy Brown, super lazy book bit matchmaking, and Philip Rowe versus Nicholas Dalby. Although there are other fights that Dalby probably would probably prefer. Uh, speaking of Randy Brown, he uh, he just beat Wellington Terman. Um, it went to decision. It's fine. I scored all three rounds for him. Uh, it was kind of like I thought. Wellington determines at 170, and I don't, I don't think it fixes anything. I don't think it does anything. The only real highlight of this fight for me was John Anik being a dumbass. Because for those who do not know, I, I run a, a mixed martial arts simulator, which basically uh has every fighter you could probably think of in there plus like my viewers my listeners friends family etc anyone i've trained with is probably got a fighter in there and we do like a career mode whatever so i keep a little size chart of like fighters usually the top 50 per topology in each weight class and uh john anik had a moment here where he's like oh, it's just disappointing that wellington Terman's not against uh, somebody he's going to be bigger than like he says six foot tall guy that's gonna be really tall at the weight class he just gets six foot three randy brown Normally, he's going to be fighting guys who are like 5'7", five, 5'9". Five, there is one guy in the Tapology Top 50 who is 5'7", at this weight class. And he's not in the UFC because it's Ray Cooper the third. And then, and these, these are slightly old numbers, so it's, it, may, it, may, it may have slightly changed. But it's never been particularly high. And there are four guys 5'8", or 5'9". And again... One of those, Logan Storley, not in the promotion. Two of those are former lightweights, Rafael Dos Anjos and Francisco Trinaldo, who are just kind of old men not count- cutting weight anymore. And the other one is Jeremiah Wells. So, like, congratulations. You specifically wanted him to fight Jeremiah Wells and no one else is what I'm hearing. 
it was a it was it was a dumb moment for Anik on a night with Cruz and Cormier having a lot of dumb moments. Um, but I, I don't I don't have much else to say about the fight. It's, as soon as Brown started controlling the clinch against Terman, I'm like, this this doesn't work. You're 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 slower. You're less explosive relative to the competition. Yes, you're. I I guess bigger. I, I I guess I guess looking at him after cutting down to 170, I'm not worried about like his ability to make 170, but I, I just don't think it fixes anything. Uh, Matish Rebeskis, talk about uh talk about wrecking legs. My dude went out there and was like, "Excuse me, while I just break Radzibov's leg." Picked him apart, which led to a weird conversation about uh, DC and Cruz, like speculating. Like DC was like, he's just not used to taking those from a southpaw, and Cruz getting really worked out about like, why would you not have a southpaw in camp? I'm like, I I have to side with Cruz on this one. Like that should be a priority. That should be a thing. Uh, I think the, the real truth is that Radzipov is a very wooden striker. It just doesn't really offer much. So while he was mostly able to prevent Rebetsky from taking him down. He was very, very easy to just back up into the cage and slaughter with striking. Uh, Rebetsky also did mess up his own foot with that, so there is that. But he uh, he eventually dropped him with a punch, and then Rebe- uh, Radzipov was not done. He clearly went for a, a single leg. He was clearly ready to fight. I have no issue with the stoppage, though, because the legs were, were... It was over. The legs were buckling. The legs were not supporting him. The referee just saved him from more punishment. Although maybe not, because Rebeski was limping afterwards. So <laughs> maybe we would have had a double stoppage. Next opponents, Rebeski versus Naimov. I don't care about Radzipov, who he fights. Don't get me wrong on this. Keep him. He's a good fighter. He's UFC level. But he is very much the welcome to the UFC guy. Here are some very basic questions that I have for you vis-a-vis striking and wrestling, can you handle them? So, like, what I'm saying is his next opponent should be something like he did with Esteban uh, Rubovich, basically again. A debuting fighter from Dana White Contender Series or a debuting fighter who's been signed from the regional scene. Like, that's that's what I mean when I say I don't care. Um, I want to see him fight again. It's just there's no specific person. Uh, just as a side note, they were also like talking about how these guys look like welterweights. I don't really get that. Like, um, like I I get that they're super thick and muscular. Like they're they're big beefy boys at one fifty five, but at the same time, they're also pretty short for one like one seventy. So of course they look beefy. Uh, Tabitha Reach, Jillian Robertson. Um, I send the preview. You should probably not trust my read on on Tabitha Ricci. I have been wrong so many times. Uh, I was also sub 500 on this card uh, in general here. Uh, let me get a quick uh, a quick count of the wins here. Uh, I had Taporia. He won. I had Allen. He won. I had Magni. He won. Randy Brown. Matish Rubeski. Side five wins. And... Seven losses. I lost on Hebosh, Santos, Jillian Robertson, Zumagula, Peak, Emmers, and Brundage. Yeah, I'm right. So five, seven, and one. Wasn't a great night. Uh, I will say I got like some of the vibes of the losses right. And then just, you know, it didn't happen. I also thought Emmers straight up did win. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, this was an example of it. Like got Tabitha Ricci wrong yet again. Uh, Jillian Robertson looked, um, looked bad. Ricci looked good. Like Ricci looked good. Like her, you know, she, she controlled the stand up. She was smart about getting takedowns and then kind of just backing off and doing her thing and like, you know, remaining in control of the fight. So like she did what she had to do to get this win. But I do, I do think that this is more about, I don't know, Robertson being maybe a bit of a head case. Like, it, it, it struck me as that because her, at the end of the first round, her her corner's instantly going like, she's not, this girl's not very good. How are you doing? Come on. Like, all these things that suggest that they think it's a mental block that they have to fire her up. 
So you combine that with the fact that she is incredibly one-dimensional. Her stand-up is very bad. Her wrestling needs work. And really all she's got is she is very, very, very good from top. And you have a hard proposition to win. It's just I thought that Ricci's game would go into the clinch, would stay there, and would engage Robertson at her own game while being notably smaller. And I was kind of right. I was just wrong that that would be a problem. So congratulations to Tabitha Ricci. For her next opponent, I have Marina Rodriguez. For me to be wrong again. And with Robertson, I think it's self-reflection. I, I kind of honestly feel like, don't get me wrong, she doesn't break. She doesn't seem to react super poorly to getting hit. Like the Maria Agapo, anyone who goes through the Maria Agapova fight obviously has a willingness to fight. But I just kind of wonder with Robertson, is this what she should be doing? Or is there some other calling in life and maybe, to be honest, maybe it's just being a BJJ coach. Maybe it's just competitive BJJ and like working with the next generation of female fighters. That would be awesome. That would be dope. But um, I don't know. Every time she loses, I, I just, I feel really, I feel really bad about it in the sense that I'm just like, do I, do I want to see this again? And I don't have that with most fighters. There are a couple. Uh, Joshua Van looked very, very good against Jalga Zhumagulov. Uh, the guy, the the judge who scored it for Zhumagulov. Uh, let me get the name. Because we are checking names. I've got a list. I'm checking it like nine times over. <laughs> um, uh, as to who didn't do a good job on this card. I'm having to scroll up, of course. Uh, there it is. Uh, it was Judge Barry Luxenberg who gave the first and third to Jumagula. At least he didn't give the second because that was Van's best round. Uh, the other two judges had my scorecard, Eric Cologne and Sal Dimama 29-28 Van. Um, I'm happy to be wrong about this fight. <clears throat> I said in the lead-in, like, Van is the far more interesting fighter here in the sense that I know Jumagulov is a gatekeeper. I know he's been doomed into that that role and also that he he also doesn't want to um fight for the ufc is also a big consideration but um at the same time i was like he's still probably better like van has beaten very low level competition but no once van got on the front foot in this one he started working it man um smooth jab smooth combinations like the kick work he did was really hard to take down it seemed and uh that was a concern i had so we have a face and a guy to build the UFC's flyweight division around once again. So, big welcome to Joshua Van. I have him against Alessandro Costa next. And Jalgas Jumagulov, who I believe still has one fight on his contract. And then he's probably going to fly back to uh, fight for Kataroff. Uh, the winner of Jesus Aguilar versus Shannon Ross. If my math is correct. Trevor Peak and Chepe Mariscal. I don't have anything to say about this fight other than go watch it. It was insane. It was also painful. It was probably fight of the night for sure. It was Trevor Peak at his Trevor Peaky goodness and losing all three rounds, but being kind of da dangerous in all three and having moments in all three. And uh, I don't necessarily think Chepe is going to be a, a good fighter long term. And I do wonder what the heck you do with Trevor Peak because dude is exciting and fan pleasing and so on, but he's going to lose to anyone good. The man throws hammer fist while standing. That's all I. That's all I have. Like I use the term Bart Simpson tactics like four times in my notes here, where he's just swinging at air. Um. Mariscal, I assume, is going to go down to featherweight. And uh, someone like a Blake Builder feels appropriate for him. And then we get to Jack Jenkins versus Jamal Emers. This was the first fight I actually watched. I missed the Dumas versus Brundridge fight. I guess I'll, you know, take that one first. Uh, apparently, Dumas can wrestle at least a little bit now. And apparently, Brundridge looked really, really fat, flat. There you go. Um, 
I don't know what to do with, with Brundridge because he's kind of in that gatekeeper role, uh, like I've said, with a couple other people. And with Dumas, you might as well just rebook the Puna Sariano fight. Jamal Emers versus Jack Jenkins. I thought Emers won round two and three. I thought Jenkins won the first. I thought that was the round which Jenkins got the most done with his striking and landed the most hard leg kicks. And Emers didn't quite have his range. By the second round, Emers was starting to find his own range with the kicks and with the jabs and utilizing the fact that he is a 5'10", 74-inch frame at ben- or at Featherweight. And uh, that, was the ter- that was kind of the beginning of the end for Jenkins, I thought. And then in the third round, Emers just started to wrestle him. My big question mark with Jenkins is sort of the ground game. He wasn't bad here. He wasn't like instantly finished or anything. He wasn't put into like terrible, terrible positions even. But he is... Not great. Like, there's nothing that suggests that he's really a solid grappler, which is a bit of a problem. Like, he started just spamming elbows in the last 10 seconds of the third round, and that was, like, the most effective thing he did. Um, he has his own takedowns, by the way. He even got a headlock takeover takedown, which is so, you know, it, it's not It's not just the women's fights. Um, and he's got physical ability, and I, I really like Jack Jenkins, but uh, I thought Embers won the fight. I don't agree. I to be clear, I actually don't agree with any of the three cards for this fight. For this fight, because uh, let's see here, it was uh, Christopher Lee scoring rounds one and two for Jenkins, round three for Emmers. Admittedly, if you're going to score twenty on twenty eight, Jenkins, that is the card. But I also don't agree with uh, Troy uh, Win Win Kapow who scored all three rounds for Emers. I did think Jenkins won the first. What are the what are the numbers for that round? Be interested. Be interested to know if my read was kind of on the money here. Um Okay, apparently Emers related more strikes in the first round. I still think they were cleaner and better strikes though. So I st- I still think Jenkins, but uh at least he did have that e- that edge and Jenkins had the edge in the second round in terms of strike landed, but I just thought that that was when the quality turned in Embers' favor. So, I don't know. I guess it's not a robbery. I just think it's it's the sort of um it's the sort of decision that I would love to talk to the referees. Not the referees, the judges. I would love those three judges to come forward, explain what they saw. That's all. I don't want to agree with every judge's decision. In a, well, I do want, but I, I don't. I don't think that that is the the hallmark of it. That the fans agree with it. It's that at some point you have to come forward and talk about it, and particularly like giving Josh Emmett the first round against Tapori is a great example of like, no, no, that's wrong, and you need to explain this. You need to explain why you did this because we, as a commission, as an athletic commission, as a sport. Should not have you uh, judging stuff. Next opponents, I've got Jenkins versus William Gomes and Emmers versus Lucas Alexander. Uh, And for, I already already did the the Dumas one. I am so disappointed we didn't get Tessia Tyra versus Clydeson Rodriguez, though. I was looking forward to that, like, mm, like you wouldn't believe. Anyways, if you're on the Discord, we got Bloody Mania for July open, which is where we do... No holds barred fights in the simulator and also the career mode returns this weekend. I'm going to be running those fights tomorrow. I will see you on the Discord. And uh, if you're only a podcast listener or a YouTuber uh, listener, I will be back on Thursday with uh, fight predictions. So until then, have a good one.